Welcome to Ask the Expert. This is a brief, informative, and lively discussion with experts in type 1 diabetes and related interdisciplinary research. We're recording this event. We're going to post it on the Sugar Science site YouTube channel shortly after presentation. And if you have any questions for our guests, please feel free to enter them in the chat or raise your hand at the end of the presentation. And today we have our guest, uh, Dr. Rohit Kulkarni, MD, PhD, coming from the Joslin Center and uh, in Boston where he holds the Margaret A. Congleton chair and he's a co-section head of the Island Cell and Regenerative Biology at Joslin. And he's also a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He's recognized for research in diabetes by the Ernst Oppenheimer Award. Mm, that's pretty impressive, amazing. By the uh, Endocrine Society, the R uh, Albert Reynold Prize by the European Association for the Study of Diabetes, EASD. The Julio V. Santiago MD Memorial Lecture and the Dean's Distinguished Lecture. He's an elected member of the American Association of Clinical Investigation and the Association of American Physi Physicians. And his lab is focused on defining signaling pathways and identifying novel factors that promote regeneration of insulin secreting beta cells with a long term goal of preventing progression and or curing human diabetes. Um, he's recently had a really interesting paper come out, and I'm going to leave it to him to kind of walk us through it, but welcome um, today. Uh, for, and thank you again for joining us, uh, Dr. Kulkarni. Uh, thanks very much, Monica. So I go straight into the talk? Um, sure, yeah. Well, let, me, let me share the slide. I presume you can see this. I can. You might want to do full screen. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Uh, so thank you very much. And thanks again for the invitation to, uh, to have an informal chat about what we've been doing <clears throat> for the last several years. Uh, so we've been interested in understanding the pathways and mechanisms that are important for beta cell uh, biology in general, as well as metabolism <clears throat> Uh, overall of the organism and how the beta cell plays a role and specifically uh, type 1 diabetes is a major um, area of research in my lab. Um, so uh, I just want to make sure I gave uh, the right uh, credits to the people. So uh, this work that I'm going to describe is mostly, uh, I mean, almost all done by Sebim, who's right in the middle here. And uh, she was instrumental in leading the study, even though it took us a long time. Uh, I, in fact, we started the study like uh, five or six years ago and then uh, finally published it. Uh, <clears throat> just a little bit of background on types of diabetes. I know you guys are very well aware of it, but I just wanted to introduce uh, MODI, which is also called uh, Maturity Onset Diabetes of the Young. Uh, you're all aware of what type one is. Uh, it's an autoimmune component uh, with beta cell destruction. In type two, you have beta cells are plenty, but they're not working very well, and you have concomitants and resistance. And Modi is, a, is, is another <clears throat> type of diabetes. It's a monogenic form, which uh, occurs during adolescence or early childhood. Uh, it accounts for about 2% of all cases of diabetes in the US, for example, much higher in some other countries. Uh, but it's also important to realize that uh, as we are learning more and more about it, there are variants of uh, type 1 diabetes which are linked to Mori genes. And so this, I think, is an important observation for us to think about carefully because, you know, type 1 and type 2 are polygenic. And so uh, how these are uh, really uh, progressing to disease uh, onset and, uh, and, and the overt pathophysiology might be related to some other aspects to get a better understanding. So I just want you to to keep that in mind as I go through the studies uh, and the data, because we are potentially looking at type 1 diabetes uh, as an extension of what we did for the Modi 8. Uh, so one important, another important component which drove us to this particular Modi uh, is that <clears throat> it's unique among all the Modis and uh, that the, the gene which is mutated is in, resides in the asner cell, so the exocrine pancreas. All of the Mori genes, the mutation is in the beta cell. 
So the question then arose about six or seven years ago in my lab, you know, I was very curious, how is it that the Asner cell mutation is causing diabetes? And that opened up the possibility of understanding the crosstalk between tissues. And so shown here is an anatomical representation of the pancreas, this is the whole pancreas. Uh, and if you can look at the cross section of the, uh, the pancreas, you can see uh, you have islets which are interspersed among the Asner cells. And so, I mean, this is a teleological question. If you look at the early development, uh, the islets and the beta, the islets and the exocrine cells are, you know, formed like in equal proportions, uh, you know, 50-50 perhaps, or maybe 60-40. But as the organism develops and reaches adulthood, the Asner cells continue to remain and grow, and the islets pretty much shrink, uh, relatively speaking, and you have only 2% of the islets in the entire pancreatic volume. And they're surrounded by Asner cells from all sides. So one of the questions was, is there crosstalk between different, different cell types, which is important for us to understand in greater detail. So that was part of the thinking uh, when we started these experiments very early on. Uh, so we, we went on to do you know, the usual set of experiments to model Mori 8 uh, as in a mouse. So uh, we knocked out the Mori 8 uh, equivalent in the mouse. Uh, there's absolutely no phenotype. This took us about a year and a half. We then did another transgenic model where we knocked in uh, the specific uh, CEL gene, which is found in humans, into the mouse. Uh, and again, we did not see absolutely any phenotype. And this took us another two years. So uh, uh, you can see the, the disappointment of the people who did this work, but it was still a challenge to us as to, uh, uh, to explain the, the human phenotype. So, but this told us that uh, potentially the mouse uh, CEL gene is behaving differently. It, it's important in the context of the repeats uh, in, in the, in the, um, the um, CEL gene. Uh, only three repeats in the, in the mouse versus about 14 repeats in the human. So that could be playing a role. So more recently, we have done some other experiments where uh, I think there's a model which is emerging with our collaborators. But while we were doing that, uh, people in my lab, seven especially, went on to begin to address this in, in several different ways. So again, we took uh, uh, one of the other approaches, which one would say is rational. So is uh, well, let's take all the um, Mori uh, <clears throat> mutations that we know and create stem cells from those. Uh, so we created these stem cell lines uh, as opposed to iPS lines. Uh, we created both of them, stem cell lines and iPS lines, and we did all the experiments to look at the development and, uh, uh, in, and uh, effects on the phenotype. And uh, <laughs> again, this was completely normal. This took us another two years or two and a half years. Uh, so finally, we thought that we should really look at, uh, it must be a simple crosstalk between pancreatic acid and beta cells. And Sevim you know, was with me throughout all these experiments and I really give her credit that she kept persisting. Uh, in investigating this. So the last couple of slides, because I've been <laughs> told to restrict my slide to seven slides. Mm -hmm. uh, the last couple of slides, I want to give you one or two examples of what we did. Uh, so seven did a series of basic uh, cell biology experiments to argue that there is some kind of a transfer between these cell types and uh, the Asner cells might be transferring something to the beta cells. Uh, and the, you know, when the Asner cell gene is getting mutated, there must be some effect on the beta cell function. So she did two series of experiments. One was a co-culture experiment shown here. You grow Asner cells in one dish, beta cells in another dish. Uh, this needed some optimization because you know, each of the cell types are, are, um, uh, grow better in each in different media. So we optimize the conditions. Uh, and then she did an experiment where uh, she expressed uh, an empty vector or the wild type CEL gene. The CEL gene is the Mori 8 gene or the type 1D variant, carboxyester lipase, uh, the wild type or the mutant. Uh, and then she grew the human beta cells at the bottom here. And she collected the culture media over, over time, like two hours, six hours, 12 hours. And she observed that uh, compared to the empty vector expressing uh, 
culture media, the wild type, um, the, the wild type CEL could be detected in the, co in the culture media. Uh, the mutant was also uh, expressed and you can see the mutant is different because um, there is a, 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 a the truncation of the uh, stop codon. So it's a smaller product. Uh, but the bottom line is that uh, the culture media is, is that these proteins are being secreted from the SNR cells. And then she did the obvious thing was to take up the, uh, so both the wild type and the mutant are produced in similar quantities. She then took the lysates from these beta cells, which have been sitting here and exposed to the culture media. Uh, she washed them and then she looked at, uh, did a Western blot on the cell lysate and you can see the small amount of wild type protein, but a large amount of the mutant protein. So this clearly told us two things. One is, that these mutant uh, or the products are being secreted from SNR cells. And number two, uh, the wild type and the mutant protein products are being taken up by the beta cells. Uh, and one can quantify that. And you can see here that uh, uh, there is some amount in the wild type, but not very significant, small amount, but the mutant is significantly elevated in the beta cell lysate. So this really told us that uh, there's a transfer of protein between these uh, cell types. Uh, and then we did a second series of experiments, which I'm not showing here, you know, lack of time because I want some discussion. Uh, she just take, took out the, she, she uh, uh, cultured the Asner cell and the beta cell in two separate dishes, uh, avoiding cell contact or any, uh, not being very close to each other. And then she transferred the media from the Asner to the, the beta cell and she could show the same result. Uh, and then we also observed that these, uh, uh, the mutant protein, which is taken in the beta cell is an insoluble form. So we think that in the normal situation, uh, there is a release of these mutant uh, or the wild type protein. In the normal situation is only a wild type product from the Asner cell. And that is being taken up by endocytosis in the normal beta cell or there any other cell type which is close by. Uh, and, but that gets degraded and there's no accumulation of this wild type cell because of a number of factors, uh, which I will uh, go take up in the discussion. So this is one example of some product from the SNR cell, but there could be other products being taken up. The second question here also for the skeptics is, oh, how exactly is the product being taken up from the SNR cell into the eyelid, the eyelid has a capsule, so those are something, those, those questions are being addressed right now, because we do believe that there are some areas which, which are devoid of the capsule, which will allow uptake of certain products of the Asner cell into the beta cell in the normal situation. In the abnormal situation, where you have this uh, MODI8 or the T1D variant, uh, you have the CEL, which is mutated, being taken up by endocytosis, and we show it as endocytosis by uh, by experiments. Uh, and this uh, mutant CEL is, uh, part of it is getting into the late endosome and the lysosome, but most of it is getting accumulated in, as agrosomes. And these agrosomes we have shown is causing growth arrest of the beta cell. Uh, it alters the gene expression with defects in mitochondrial metabolism, ER stress and impaired function. So. And all this is there in the manuscript, which we have published. Uh, uh, so this is the, the take home message that we should be aware of crosstalk between Asner, or maybe the duct cells and the beta cells. We still don't, don't know what are the normal uh, uh, features of this crosstalk. And that is something that my lab is doing right now. Uh, and this particular example is uh, provided to that there may be other, you know, other states like to type two diabetes, obesity, uh, where mutant proteins could be taken up. What next? Uh, we want to think about, at least in this context, what about therapeutics? We have clues from other diseases where you have accumulation of, uh, uh, of products, you know, like Alzheimer's, there's beta amyloid peptide deposits in these um, neural cells in specific areas. In Parkinson's, you have what are called as the Lewy bodies which get deposited in the dopaminergic neurons and which cause defects in the neurons. Uh, can we take clues from these to, to address uh, how we can uh, provide therapeutics for, the, for that particular MODI8 or the type 1D variant? 
can we deliver these by exosomes, which are packaged to be taken up only by beta cells? So those are the types of experiments we're doing, follow-up experiments. Uh, and we hope that we can come back to you with more data next time. So, so Monica, I want to stop here and- uh, Yeah, no, this is, this is really fantastic. It's a great sort of a high level view and thank you very much for walking us through it. Um, if anyone is in the audience and would like to um, ask a question, just feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Um, Should I, I stop sharing? Should I stop sharing? I, I love that other, you can continue to share. I, I love that previous slide. It's really interesting. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I was reading some of your work and, and I think some of the first, um, you know, kind of insight, I guess, that was mentioned was that a lot of times the, well, let me just let somebody else in the room. A lot of times, you know, with diabetes type one, type two, and Modi, um, along comes some digestive problems as well. And so, you know, that that's sort of like a smoking gun, right? I mean, what what's happening there? I mean, maybe that maybe that's part of this uh, the way that the Asnar cell, um, you know, is is able to communicate with the beta cell due to some of its some some kind of dysfunction that's. A, you know, ongoing. I don't know. What are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I agree with you. And I think that in diabetes, uh, as you mentioned, there are defects in, in the digestive enzyme system as well, which can have an effect on the gut. And the gut could be, you know, having the defects in the microbiome, which could go back and talk to the beta cell. So there are multiple ways that we might identify defects, and we should be careful in how these organelles or our tissues are communicating with each other. So uh, so that is one thing that we're addressing, uh, at least in the context of elastase, for example, which is secreted from uh, uh, this uh, tissue matrix cells uh, and which, which are not part of the islet per se, but are part of the uh, Essner cell repertoire. And those, and we know that elastase, fecal elastase is used as a marker of poor digestion, as you as you remarked, but also has effects on, on the local milieu in the islets. And so uh, how come no one has looked at that? And my lab has been looking at that for the last few years, and we hope that uh, we'll come up with some important uh, information in that context. Yeah, I think no stone should be left unturned in, in, in context of this. And this, it's really interesting that Modi 8, you know, can, you know, really sort of shed some light on, on, on this new way of thinking about things. Um, when you talk about the mutated CEL, the carboxyl ester lipase gene, um, is that a global situation in Modi 8 and how does it impact other tissues, if so? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the mutation would affect uh, wherever carboxyl ester lipase is, uh, is present. Uh, it's predominantly expressed in Asner cells. We know that there is some expression of that in breast cells, mammary tissue. Uh, these individuals don't have any specific uh, phenotype in that context, which tells us that the expression levels are extremely low uh, and perhaps in the adult are not of great significance. Um, but, but the effects in the asthma cells and expression levels are sky high in the normal situation. And so when that gets mutated, I think it's a predominant effect on the asthma cells. Okay. Um, yeah, that's interesting. And then I wondered, you know, we talked a little bit sort of offline about the fact that, um, you know, maybe the beta cells have a super sensitive UPR. Um, I, I don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit more about that in, in context of your work. Yeah, so one of the questions that uh, we were wondering about and it also you know came up in the reviewers uh, comments was are these uh, mutant products being taken up only by the beta cells or are they being taken up by other cell types uh, and we did look at that carefully and the amount in the beta cell obviously is high but they're also taken up by other cell types the as the alpha cells and the delta cells um, and, and and clearly it is it's it's, it's present in the asner cell and we think that um, the mechanisms for their degradation are probably um, uh, appropriate for the other cell types to, to, to modify and allow them to be taken up by uh, mechanisms like the late endosome and the lysosome. But in the beta cell, there is an activation of the disallowed genes. 
and those <laughs> disallowed. Oops, sorry. Uh, Somebody needs to mute themselves. I think Tina Zhang. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, before I'm doing more like a, uh -oh. uh, animal work, <laughs> right now I have a minimum. <laughs> uh, I don't know whether you can mute her or not. I will try. <laughs> sorry. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so. uh yes i will need it okay great keep going sorry yeah sorry that's great that. so yeah and uh, so uh, the beta cell has these disallowed genes which uh, are important for the beta cell to to behave normally um, and so we we noticed that the expression of disallowed genes is pushing these beta cells to, to uh, activate their endoplasmic reticular stress pathways. And that's one of the pathways which is clearly altered when uh, the agrosomes are present and, and the accumulated products are present in the beta cell. So we think that although it's taken up by other cell types, uh, the other cell types are not manifesting any defects because of the presence of disallowed genes in the beta cell. Yeah, that's an interesting, um you know, uh, I guess sort of interpretation of it. And I wondered how that might um, kind of play together with the work that's come out of Anil Bouchon's lab and Peter Thompson's lab that, you know, the, the cells, the beta cells are not all dying, but many of them are, are undergoing senescence. Um, is that something you can talk about a little bit or hypothesize about like, would these aggregates drive senescence? And, you know, if so, if you can like get rid of the aggregates, could these uh, beta cells come back online? Yeah, well, that's a good point. Totally speculative, but. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that, but that's an important context because um, we, we were also wondering, you know, if there are only some cells are taking up these products and it's only affecting some beta cells. Why is there such a big defect which leads to diabetes? Why aren't they repairing these? themselves very quickly. And so uh, we know that uh, ER stress can, can be transmitted between cell types. And you know, that's something which is uh, very odd to think about that, okay, you know, how, what, how exactly is ER stress being transmitted? Uh, there are products which are being produced by the cell which get secreted and affect neighboring cells. Uh, but that has been clearly shown in senescence, what are called as the senescence activated uh, factors uh, S or the SASP factor, SAS factors, where a senescent cell will produce factors from it and, and it's going to affect all the cells surrounding itself. And so in that context, I think uh, uh, whether some of these uh, products which are present in this cell with the mutated CEL product is also uh, behaving like a senescent cell and that can lead to additional beta cell death because it induces bystander apoptosis, for example. So the cells are just standing by and it induces apoptosis in those. So can we use uh, senolytics to uh, get rid of that particular senescent cell and then pr promote more healthy beta cells? That's one potential possibility. Uh, so I think that there are many ways that we could think about, but we want to first try and see whether we can use an exosome delivery approach, uh, uh, whether we can, ident we have identified beta cell specific exosomes secreted by ASNR versus duct cells. So yeah. can we, you know, place something in the vesicles in those exosomes and deliver them to these beta cells, uh, something that could reduce the agrosome. So, uh, it's not such a uh, figment of my imagination, but it's potentially practical. So we are trying to do that, do those set of experiments right now. Yeah, no, and I mean, it, it really mirrors what's happening, you know, some of the approaches that are, um, you know, happening in Parkinson's, right? And, and uh, Alzheimer's, you know, trying to knock down these aggregates with different strategies and then see, see what happens. I guess, one other thing that's kind of in, of interest is, you know, when you're looking at um, the the sort of the aggregate accumulation, 
and thinking about the patchiness of type one diabetes in the islet, the patchiness of beta destruction. What would you think, how do you think about that? Yeah, so the lobular pattern in type one has, has emerged as an important uh, phenotype. And uh, <clears throat> it tells us about the heterogeneity of the disease very clearly that each individual has their own uh, uh, patterns of presentation. Uh, but it, it definitely took the, the community by surprise when you know, all along we've been looking at the NOD model and then we see insulitis in all islets, but then in humans, uh, it looks like it's a lobular pattern. Uh, and so it, it goes back to this concept of potentially, you know, are there some cells which are more susceptible, are there heterogeneous cell types which are more susceptible, and then that will induce this SAS phenotype where surrounding cells get affected very quickly. And so it becomes a lobular pattern, whereas in other, in other lobules of the pancreas, uh, it's able to overcome this initial defect. Uh, the, the, the SASP effect is not as dramatic as in some. So, I mean, I'm speculating here, but uh, uh, I think there are people who are doing single cell analysis of these different lobules of the islet mm -hmm. cell types, you know, Clay, Cleeton Matthews and Martha Campbell Johnson and others. Uh, and so I think we might get more clues on the single cell analysis from these cell types to the neighboring lobules in the same, in, same patient uh, showing normal cells versus others not knowing. So what is the chromatin signature in those? Uh, but, but, you know, one limitation there is we don't get the longitudinal uh, picture, yeah. unfortunately. We just get a snapshot. And so yeah. uh, how exactly it develops over a period of time is continues to be a challenge. Yeah, it's, it would be great to be able to, you know, maybe look in the prodrome um, and see if you can see any evidence of this kind of, you know, behavior. Um, what you've shown here, I mean, I, I mean, I guess those samples are pretty rare. Yeah, I mean, getting these uh, pancreas from these individuals, there's only five families in the whole world. And so uh, we, we were uh, fortunate to get one, from one individual who passed on, unfortunately. Uh, we got those sections and we, we really, done a lot of experiments with those uh, pancreas. Do you think that the Modi um, phenotype is sometimes misdiagnosed as type one? Yes, uh, <laughs> I definitely think so. At least at the Jocelyn, you know, we have what is called as the medalist study where patients with type one diabetes get a medal when they have reached uh, over 50 years of uh, being with type one. And uh, George King, who leads the study, has done an incredible job of uh, the, leading that effort. And they've done very systematic testing of those patients with type 1. And, and they find that up to 20% of those individuals are not actually type 1. And I think that there's... Wow. Uh, and so th there, is, there is an important uh, lesson to be learned there, uh, to be careful about that particular diagnosis, but also calls for more careful monitoring and uh, treatment options because those individuals who are not type 1 should not be on insulin. They should be on something else because yeah. there are some ways to treat other types of modis. And so uh, that, has been, that has brought up a very important uh, point in that field to be careful about diagnosis. For the endo fellows listening. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So. This is really great. Um, I thank you so much for spending, you know, the, this uh, short uh, time with us and um, just walking us through this really interesting way of thinking about, the, um, you know, what's happening in both Modi eight and and possible, you know, footprints that this kind of mechanism might have in type one. It's really fantastic. Last call for questions. I see there's several in the audience here, but no one has answered. No one has sent a question to me yet. Oh, I see go. my colleague, uh, Dr. Maidler, is there. So she's... Yes, okay. And great. it just a, a trying, a great, great talk. <laughs> great to see you. I'm trying to unmask yourself because I'm working in the evening in the vaccine center here. So Bremen oh. is <laughs> pioneering it. Um, okay, <laughs> I'm like, good talk forever. And um, the question I had, like, you know, I, I, I'm not sure if you've seen this, like Ben Giebman in, in Groningen. He has once looked at this um, um, a nano, like EM, um, um, 
uh, protocols uh, and has observed at the um, periphery in the islets to, to the exocrine pancreas that the beta cells look much different um, next to the exocrine than like rather in the like in around, right? And so we worked with him and also have observed um, these changes that these cells probably more prone to apoptosis, may, may be more prone to dysfunction. So, so have you seen this? Have you looked at this? Like if uh, well, even like in a normal pancreas, in a non-diabetic pancreas, these cells are more prone to changes or maybe these are the ones which start. Because like what Marta shows us that the exocrine pancreas and diabetes also has a problem, right? We have a reduction in, in the exocrine mass. And so that it could be that even the exocrine initiates the whole thing, right? The whole problem. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, you're right. I think so what we have done, actually, we have, we have done the reverse. We have looked at the Asner cells, which are surrounding each islet. And, and we can show that the Asner cell, which are very close to the uh, beta cells, are looking very different uh, from Asner cells, which are further away from the beta cell. And so we're trying to understand why are the Asner cells different? Are they, uh, for example, what happens when, there's, when the beta cell is stressed? Do they behave differently and vice versa? So... Uh, yeah, that's a good point. And I think uh, the, I need to look up uh, that paper that you're mentioning to really see uh, what kind of experiments have been done to look at the beta cells, which are very close to Asner cells. Uh, but there's a lot to be learned there for sure. Mm. Yeah, it's really cool. He has mapped the whole pancreas with n together and then could see through EMV cells. I can send you this. This is really cool. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Okay. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for attending. Thanks for the great question. I I had one last question. Just thinking about Coxsackie and what you just said there with um, that work uh, with the exocrine pancreas maybe sort of driving the bus in the beginning. You know, there's a lot of um, you know work that indicates Coxsackie virus may be a potential trigger, environmental trigger for type one. You know, and and is uh, do the Asner cells actually you know get um, um, infected by Coxsackie virus, are they, are they, you know, one of the ones that also are impacted by Coxsackie virus? This might be a very basic question, but. Yeah, that's a good point, Monica. I think that, uh, I know that Desio and Anne in this group have done a lot of work with the Coxsackie. Uh, we have not, we have dealt with it in a different in the context. We are doing some work on mRNA methylation where we are looking at the effect of viruses, but but no, we have not looked in specifically in this context whether Asner cells are being affected by Coxsackie. Maybe they are. Maybe Catherine wanted to say something. Yeah, sure. Say something. Maybe. Thank you. Let me answer this. So they are affected in the same way. We looked at the um, SM fish method uh, to pick up a wire mRNA, a wire RNA from the Coxsackie, like from the whole antiviral um, genome, basically. And since this has been known by VP1 staining, right, it's um, very much. Um, in the islands, um, we challenged a little bit that hypothesis, and then we could really see it with using input material all over the pancreas. So it's in immune cells where we expected it, but we also see it in asymmetric cells. So we stained it with amylase, and it's, um, I mean, it's not many cells, right? It's very, very few viral positive cells, but it's very similar uh, in the amount of infection in the, in the exocrine as well as in the endocrine. Can look at the cell report medicine paper <laughs> in the endpoint homepage. <laughs> Great question. Great. I will things. look for that, and I'm gonna. Yeah, this that. is how I also got into the exocrine investigation. Right, there must be something in the exocrine that maybe triggers something, and then through paracrine events, whatever they are, or the ones you are describing, Rohit, to uh, uh, trigger the um, vulnerability to uh, of the eyelids. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> More to do. It takes the village to to keep all things uh, working there in the pancreas, and it, it's it's starting to look more and more like there's a lot more communication than was originally um, understood. So, fantastic talk and discussion. Thank you again, and I look forward to sharing this with our scientific community and getting feedback on it. So, thanks again. I, I hope you both have a great rest of your day. Great. Thanks very much, Monica. Have a good day. Thanks, Monica. Ciao, Rohit. <laughs>